Brick Court is immensely proud to have had Jonathan as a member and as our head of chambers and friend. And we've established this series of lectures as a mark of our deepest respect, affection and admiration for him and in recognition of his immense contribution to chambers, to commercial law and to the bar in general. It's absolutely fitting that Lord Justice Gross has agreed to give tonight's lecture. Not only is Peter one of the most distinguished commercial lawyers of his generation, after a leading practice at the bar, he has adorned the bench both as a judge in the commercial court and in the court of appeal. But also, and perhaps most important of all, he was one of Jonathan's very best friends. They were truly great mates. And so, without further ado, I'm absolutely delighted to invite Peter to deliver the Jonathan Hurst Commercial Law Lecture for 2018. Ladies and gentlemen, the invitation by Brick Court Chambers <clears throat> to deliver the second Jonathan Hurst QC Commercial Law Lecture is a great honor, uh, all the more so on this poignant occasion, the first such lecture when we are without Jonathan, uh, a very close friend, an outstanding colleague, and as Mark Howard has just said, sorely missed by all here. Uh, my title is Courts and Arbitration. I think it is a fitting topic. It is how Jonathan and I first met on opposite sides in successive hearings. From first meeting as opponents, we and our families became the closest of friends. It was in the best traditions of the bar and our system has benefited enormously from the force of such traditions. Vigorous opposition in court or arbitration never once becoming personal. Quite the contrary. Subsequently, we worked together on the Bar Council, where Jonathan was, as might be expected, a most effective and popular chairman. Business was conducted with dispatch and good humor. We normally adjourned to a better place uh, after as short a meeting time as possible. Later still, we holidayed together in Norfolk, South Africa and Barbados, where the most rigorous attempts at imposing dietary moderation on both of us were scrupulously ignored. So well captured by Jonathan in his wonderful and aptly entitled private memoir, giving it both barrels. I am delighted to see Fiona, Charles, Pamela, Lady Hurst, Rachel and Leslie Johnson, Sarah Cox, Simon Hurst here tonight. In fact, my connection with the Hurst family dates back to very happy memories of appearing in front of Sir David, Lord Justice Hurst. I always enjoyed those occasions, uh, even when he would make it clear robustly clear early on that he was firmly against me. And he and I shared an abiding sense of injustice that the Nicholas H. was wrongly decided in the House of Lords. My theme tonight is that our courts and London arbitration are complementary and mutually reinforcing, comprising a feature of the first importance for legal UK. We need both as we seek to maintain and strengthen the global leadership position of London and English law post-Brexit, as I shall seek to explore. I will look first at the relationship between courts and arbitration, then at the courts, finally at arbitration. I should make it clear that the views expressed are my own. The courts and arbitration, the state has two primary duties, defense of the realm and the provision of a justice system. If the state succumbs to its external enemies, all is lost. 
If the state does not uphold law and justice, no other rights can be enforced or entitlements enjoyed. The provision of civil justice by the state is an integral part of that second duty. The provision of civil justice is a public good securing the rule of law, not simply another public service. As famously observed by Lord Diplock in Bremer Vulcan and South India shipping, every civilized system of government requires that the state should make available to all its citizens a means for the just and peaceful settlement of disputes between them as to their respective legal rights. The means provided are courts of justice to which every citizen has a constitutional right of access. The focus on the state's duty in the justice sphere does not at all diminish the scope and importance of the private sector in arbitration. Conceptually, arbitration is respected and thrives in this jurisdiction as a matter of party autonomy and choice within a tolerant and light touch statutory supervisory regime stemming from the Arbitration Act 1996, succinctly summarized by the previous Lord Chief Justice, Lord Thomas of Cungiath, last year, maximum support, minimum interference. It was not always so. Thus, in Zarniko and Roth Schmidt, 1922, the suggestion that the parties to an arbitration agreement could exclude the court's jurisdiction to correct errors of law was dismissed by Lord Justice Scrutton with a trenchant or memorable phrase, there must be no Alsatia in England where the king's writ does not run. That said, as noted by his biographer, errors of law apart, Scrutton was not in favor uh, of challenges to arbitration awards and expressed the wish that commercial men would be content with the finality of arbitration awards, not only when they won, but also when they lost. It was ever thus. This policy steer from the Zarniko decision prevailed until winds of change began blowing in the 1970s, resulting in the Arbitration Act 1979 and culminating in the 1996 Act. The 1979 Act repealed the special case procedure, but contained no rules as to how the matter of leave to appeal from the arbitrators to the court should be handled, other than that leave could only be granted on a question of law which had substantially to affect the rights of one of the parties. That gap was filled by the seminal decision of the House of Lords in the NEMA in which Lord Diplock, in what would become known as the NEMA guidelines, effectively legislated for the narrowest of gateways. Section 69 of the 1996 Act enacted the NEMA guidelines into statutory form, with some change of language. In essence, there had to be a question of law which substantially affected the rights of the parties and on which the arbitrator's decision was either obviously wrong, or which, being a question of general public importance, was at least open to serious doubt. Additionally, it had to be just and proper for the court to determine the question. In keeping with the philosophy of the 1996 Act, placing party autonomy at the forefront of policy considerations, parties were permitted to contract out of the right to appeal. Where they have not done so, the statutory tests, uh, in Sir Bernard Ricks's words, leave scope for the wisdom of commercial judges who hear applications for leave to appeal in the commercial court. Intriguingly, Lord Diplock himself, when developing the NEMA guidelines and narrowing the gateway for recourse to the court, noted the role that court review of arbitral awards had played in developing the English law of commercial contracts to the benefit of commercial parties. As he put it, it is only if parties to commercial contracts can rely upon a uniform construction 
being given to standard terms that they can prudently incorporate them in their contracts without the need for detailed negotiation or discussion. Such uniform construction of standard terms had been progressively established up to 1979, largely through decisions of the courts upon special cases stated by arbitrators. In the result, English commercial law has achieved a degree of comprehensiveness and certainty that has made it acceptable for adoption as the proper law to be applied to commercial contracts wherever made by parties of whatever nationality. The downside, of course, lay in an inability to achieve finality with attendant cost, publicity and delay, creating a disincentive in the international market to arbitrate in London. The utility of Section 69 of the 1996 Act uh, and the appropriateness of such appeal mechanisms generally uh, is not without controversy. There are contrasting viewpoints. The first is that parties to an arbit arbitration should have no possibility of appealing to a court on a point of law. The arbitral process would thus be very largely insulated from judicial scrutiny uh, and from the cost and time taken up by a court-based appellate process. Article 35.6 of the ICC rules excludes an appeal process, as does Article 26.8 of the uh, London Court of International Arbitration rules. At the other extreme, <clears throat> there is the view that Section 69 should be amended to enable appeals to the court to be more readily available. Underpinning this view, given prominence by Lord Thomas in the, in the 2016 Bailey Lecture, is the concern that reducing the flow of arbitral appeals harms the development of the common law. Thus, the very benefits Lord Diplock had identified in the NEMA of the pre-1979 position were in danger of being lost. Uh, more recently, Lord Thomas has reiterated that view. Where should the balance lie? My own view is straightforward, though not complacent. The answer does not lie with the outliers on either side of the debate, though they may provide food for thought. Broadly speaking, we have the balance right. Let me explain. As foreshadowed, some have promoted the idea of an arbitral lex mercatoria. Such a view would see Section 69 as not just an unnecessary encroachment on arbitration, but a wholly unjustifiable interference with it and its development into a freestanding dispute resolution method. With respect, this has always struck me as what might be termed a fundamentalist pipe dream, entailing that international arbitration can be an island unto itself, that it could be a self-contained and private means of adjudication free of the moorings of the nation state uh, and a supportive court system. To my mind, this idea faces intractable problems and insuperable hurdles. I address it only briefly. First, confidentiality would at a minimum impede the development of an arbitral lex mercatoria. Secondly, it is difficult to see how, without state support, an arbitral regime could compel witnesses, issue enforceable injunctive relief, or enforce awards. Once this proposition is accepted, then it must be recognized that no state will lend its coercive power unconditionally to some super, supranational arbitral law. Thirdly, as Mr. John Beachy, with his vast experience, has astutely observed, there is a fundamental distinction to be drawn between transparency of process and procedure and respect for the confidentiality of the substance of the dispute. Preserving the latter does not reduce the need for the former. While there is scope for institutional arbitration schemes to address the need for transparency, there are circumstances where arbitration would struggle to do so without the assistance of a supportive court system. 
a very recent decision of the Court of Appeal on the alleged apparent bias of an arbitrator provides a telling example. Halliburton and Chubb Bermuda Insurance arose out of the Deepwater Horizon oil rig disaster in the Gulf of Mexico. Halliburton made a claim on its liability insurance against Chubb, which Chubb refused to pay. The terms of the cover provided for London arbitration. The parties could not agree on the identity of the third arbitrator. A judge of the commercial court made an order appointing M as the third arbitrator. When Halliburton subsequently discovered uh, that Chubb had asked M to act as arbitrator in two other arbitrations concerning overlapping subject matter, Halliburton applied for M's removal under the 1996 Act on the ground of apparent bias. The judge in the commercial court refused the application and his judgment was upheld on appeal. The Court of Appeal, while holding that as a matter of good practice in international arbitration and as a matter of law, M should have made disclosure to Halliburton at the time of his appointment, decided that the fair-minded and reasonable observer would not conclude that there was a real possibility that the arbitrator was biased. In its judgment, the Court of Appeal gave clear guidance on the proper application of the bias test to arbitrators who take appointment in several arbitrations with overlapping issues and a common party, and the nature of any disclosure that needs to be made, together with discussing the consequences of non-disclosure. Even assuming that the rules of an arbitration scheme could have made provision for resolving the issues in Halliburton, authoritative resolution by the court was manifestly preferable with the additional advantage that guidance could be given for other cases. Turning to the other side of the divide, should appeals to court be made more readily available? There are legitimate concerns about the onward march of arbitration. Thus, is arbitration appropriate in the sphere of non-disclosure agreements currently receiving much prominence? Similarly, is arbitration the optimal dispute resolution mechanism for employment contracts? In each of these areas, is the confidentiality accompanying private dispute resolution in the public interest? Should there be an absence of scrutiny of conduct that is or might be contrary to the public interest? More generally, in terms of public policy, what are or ought to be the limits of confidentiality in arbitration. The questions raised by Lord Thomas chime with these concerns. Are the courts being starved of cases through which the law could be developed? Are parties to arbitration and arbitrators escaping public scrutiny? They are therefore entirely proper questions. That said, with great respect, I part company with the approach canvassed by Lord Thomas namely widening the gateways for appeals to the court. In that I am not alone, there being noteworthy contributions from amongst others, Lord Saville, the principal architect of the 1996 Act, and Sir Bernard Eder. My reasons are these. One, conceptually, the approach suggests a zero-sum game. A so-called gain for arbitration means a corresponding loss for the courts and presumably vice versa. I'm afraid that I simply do not see the relationship between the courts and arbitration in these terms. Secondly, analytically, those who choose private dispute resolution wish to resolve their disputes. That is their legitimate individual free choice and it is a matter of party autonomy. They owe no duty, moral, legal or otherwise, to encourage and fund appeals so as to develop the law. As Lord Devlin observed, in the late 1970s, when the proposal to limit rights of appeal was being discussed, the next step would, I suppose, he said, be a prohibition placed on the settlement of cases concerning interesting points of law. Now, that would be an interesting prohibition. Three. 
though there are self-evidently fewer cases coming to the courts since the demise of the special case procedure, it is far from clear that the statistics justify going significantly further. In a valuable note prepared by Ms. Cara North of Justice, after analysing commercial court figures for 2012 to 2016, she expressed this view, quote, it is impossible to conclude from these figures that the decline in the number of cases issued before English courts is a consequence of the popularity of arbitration. Such a conclusion would require the collection of data over a longer period of time, a better understanding of the court statistics and comparative analysis of arbitration and litigation trends. Absent such information, it is difficult to confidently assess the decline in the number of cases, the reasons for such a decline, and whether the success of arbitration is truly having the negative impact on commercial litigation that academics and judges fear. This is an area that warrants further research and consideration." End quote. Four, a flow of important commercial cases continues to find their way to the courts via appeals from arbitration proceedings. Examples are readily to hand. Three which reached the Supreme Court will suffice. The Golden Victory, the Achilleus, and the more recent Fulton shipping case. Pulling the threads together, I do not see the courts and arbitration as engaged in a competition for work. I see the strength of legal UK augmented by a strong court reinforcing thriving London arbitration, with London arbitration in turn increasing the attractions of English law and thus ultimately the English courts. As I have said before, this is a mutually supportive relationship. The strength of one supports the strength of the other and vice versa. The attractions of arbitration will not be enhanced by some sort of UDI from state courts. Equally, the courts should focus on other means of strengthening themselves, a matter to which I shortly turn, rather than a damaging competition with London arbitration. If the careful balance struck in the 1996 Act were to be upset, there would be a risk that both the courts and arbitration in London would be harmed. The latter, because a perception of increased court intervention in arbitration would reduce London's attractiveness as an arbitral centre of choice. The former, because it would see the court having to intervene more often in disputes where it otherwise need not. A balance which reflects an arbitral and litigation culture of maximum support, minimum interference, could all too easily be lost. Compelling and significant evidence would be needed before such a balance should be altered. At the present time, it is not clear that such evidence exists. We should not be unduly troubled about a pendulum adjusting over time between courts and arbitration. There is indeed nothing new about that. Fashions change from time to time. In any event, the handling of the Section 69 gateway, and thus the lever for adjusting the flow of appeals, rests, as Sir Bernard Ricks observed, with the good judgment of commercial court judges. I turn to the second principle heading, the courts. Moving from the interrelationship between the courts and arbitration to the courts, let me be absolutely clear the strength of the judiciary and the courts are vital for legal UK, very much including London arbitration, for Brexit and beyond. I have previously suggested that the fundamentals are sound and we can face the future with confidence, though certainly not with complacency. To recap, the judiciary's independence, integrity and incorruptibility are beyond question so too its impartiality. The English courts do not confer a home ground advantage, and there is neither advantage nor disadvantage in being a private or a state enterprise. Next, there is the judiciary's well-respected calibre 
and expertise generating market confidence. We have, not for a moment to be overlooked, a world-class legal profession based in London. The courts operate within a framework governed by the rule of law, a fundamental strength which we tend to take for granted, though we should not. Moreover, English law has been fashioned by the genius of the common law in doing practical justice, which, when combined with a calibre judiciary, applying precedent in a disciplined fashion, provides the requisite confidence to commercial parties contracting on the basis of a settled framework of law while furnishing the flexibility necessary to deal with constantly changing, a constantly changing commercial world. Across the board, not only in connection with arbitration, our courts respect party autonomy. For example, when interpreting contracts, the court's task is to give effect to that bargain, not to rewrite it to create the bargain the courts think the parties should have made. In summary, the judiciary and the courts are pivotal for our system of justice and comprise a key factor in its international reputation. London and English law, however, have no preordained right to preeminence. We cannot rest on our laurels. Fortunately, we are not doing so, and it is worthwhile highlighting some of the work the judiciary is undertaking to face the future. First, innovation. The financial list is one such example. So too, the as yet untested financial markets test case scheme, enabling parties to obtain definitive guidance on novel market issues, albeit no cause of action exists between them. Moreover, the judiciary seeks to stay in touch with the ever-changing commercial world, and hence the importance attached to the Financial Markets Law Committee with its wide-ranging program covering developments in the city. Secondly, structural reform, creating the business and property courts, bringing together all the specialist jurisdictions of the High Court in England and Wales, thereby for tonight's purposes, facilitating the appropriate cross-jurisdictional deployment of judges with suitable experience and expertise, while preserving and not diluting the brand of the commercial court itself, if I may emphasize, a matter of the very first importance. Thirdly, taking advantage of the benefits of technology. This is a no-brainer, uh, unless we wish to turn our backs on much of contemporary life. Uh, with specific reference to the business and property courts, e-filing is now a reality. It is also the case that the business and property courts do not exist in isolation from the rest of the court system. They too are included in the £1 billion HMCTS reform program, which is a once-in-a-generation opportunity to modernise the delivery of justice uh, in a manner fit for the 21st century, domestically and internationally. Uh, indeed, it is salutary for commercial lawyers to keep in mind that the business and property courts cannot continue to flourish if the remainder of the justice system crumbles. The preparedness and ability to embrace technological change, a necessary part of the reform program, will likewise keep the courts up to speed as new ideas such as blockchain and fintech uh, introduce the potential for major changes in various markets. Fourthly, reform of our own procedures. In keeping with the well-deserved reputation of the commercial court, the court with which I am most familiar, for reform of its own procedures, the business and property courts are grappling with the problems of disclosure in a digital age and are, in my view, on that topic, rightly pursuing cultural change in keeping with market demand. Fifthly, international engagement. This is a vast field of major importance, but time permits only mention of only one aspect tonight, namely the Standing International Forum of Commercial Courts, which produces the acronym CIFOC. The judiciary is well aware of competition in the market for international dispute resolution, together with the desire of many jurisdictions 
to develop their own commercial courts. We have embraced these developments constructively and with confidence through the mechanism of CIFOC, seeking cooperation, sharing best practice, and making a stronger contribution to the rule of law together than each of the courts involved could accomplish individually. All this is to the good, and I hope dispels any notion of complacency. Inevitably, there are threats and challenges too. I have spoken of them before. My views are unchanged, and I do no more than note them tonight. First and foremost, we need to address the difficulties currently encountered with judicial recruitment and retention. Given the importance of the judiciary and the courts to our international standing, any, de any decline in the quality of our judiciary will not only undermine confidence in our courts, but will likewise pose a threat to London as an arbitration centre. Secondly, the challenges and uncertainties posed by Brexit. Though let me make it plain that as a judge, I express no view whatever as to the politics of Brexit one way or another and would not want to be misunderstood in that regard. The two particular areas of concern are first the absence of a legislative steer as to how the courts should treat post-exit uh, European Court of Justice decisions with the attendant risk that there will be, quote, outsourcing from parliaments to the courts on a grand scale. The second concern goes to the need for clarification on a number of issues where our current arrangements hinge on membership of the European Union. We need to address these threats and challenges to meet them and to make the right choices to overcome them. Pausing there, it should not be thought that I am simply focusing on the potential downsides of Brexit. There are apparent opportunities as well. First, an end to Luxembourg uh, jurisdiction means an end to time-consuming waits for references to that court. Secondly, a distancing from the jurisprudence uh, of the uh, Court of Justice of the European Union may not be unwelcome in the arbitration context to which I shall come very shortly. Thirdly, and perhaps still more importantly, we must maintain perspective so that Brexit does not become an all-consuming single issue. We need to look beyond Brexit and ensure that this jurisdiction remains ahead of the game in addressing technological change that will assuredly alter the way business is done. We must and can do so. For the reasons already given, we have the right fundamentals. And not to be overlooked, we also enjoy great advantages in terms of language and time zone. The third heading, arbitration. What of arbitration? I sense interesting challenges ahead. Their confidentiality can properly be described as one of the leading attractions of international arbitration. It generates controversy, giving ammunition to critics with no obvious consensus on the way forward. Further, comparing arbitration to litigation, there must be scepticism as to the perceived cost advantages of arbitration, not least because the parties need to foot the bill for premises and the tribunal, a bill likely way in excess of court fees. As with London litigation, so London arbitration needs to keep a close eye on remaining competitive as to costs. Still further, certainly in this jurisdiction, I somewhat doubt that arbitration trumps litigation in terms of speed from initiation of the dispute to final resolution, subject only, if not unimportantly, to appeals. Standing back, however, the place of international arbitration in global dispute resolution is secure. At its most basic, it fills the essential need of providing a neutral forum with appropriate expertise for the resolution of international commercial disputes without requiring either party to agree to the other's court jurisdiction. From the vantage point of legal UK, the preservation and strengthening of London's world-leading position as an arbitration centre or hub is a matter of the highest importance. Provided we work at it, there are good reasons to be optimistic 
as to the future. On any view, the enforcement of awards under the New York Convention is wholly unaffected by Brexit. The legal and commercial infrastructure supporting London arbitration is of the highest quality, both in terms of strength and depth. The supportive role of the court in supervision, the attractions of English law, and the linguistic attraction of the English language need no further emphasis. Moreover, as already indicated, there is a view that Brexit carries distinct advantages for London arbitration. There have been, with respect, troubling aspects of the CJEU jurisprudence, perhaps placing doctrinal purity ahead of commercial practicality. Most obviously, this manifested itself in the distaste for anti-suit injunctions, a robust common law remedy for which there might be more opportunities in the future. Matters do not quite end there. Very recently, the uneasy relationship between the CJEU and arbitration has been illuminated by the decision in Slovak Republic and ACMIA. The case arose from a dispute between a Dutch insurance company and, a, and Slovakia. The dispute was brought by way of an arbitration under a bilateral investment treaty known as a BIT. An arbitration award was made against Slovakia, which then sought to set aside the award before the German courts, contending that the arbitral tribunal had no jurisdiction as the BIT arbitration clause was in conflict with EU law. The dispute was referred to the court in Luxembourg, which held that the relevant clause was in conflict with EU law. The parties to the BIT had established a mechanism for settling disputes between an investor and a member state, which could prevent those disputes from being resolved in a manner that ensured the full effectiveness of EU law. In essence, such disputes had been removed from the purview of national courts the means by which EU law was interpreted and applied. Though the CJEU decision was confined to bits and the court sought to distinguish commercial arbitration, the decision and its reasoning could aptly be described as troubling more generally. Conclusion. There can be no doubting the importance of the topics under discussion tonight. As is, I hope, by now well known, the UK's legal services sector contributes £25.7 billion to the UK economy, or 1.6% of gross value added. It generates some £3.3 billion in annual export revenue. The courts and London arbitration are crucial to the well-being of this sector. In my view, we can face the future with confidence but aware of the challenges which arise. There will be a crowded agenda. A first-class commercial silk and arbitrator, Jonathan Hurst would have well recognised the truth in the claim that London and English law are world leaders in the field of international dispute resolution. Legal UK stands at the forefront of commercial dispute resolution. There is every reason it should remain that way. Brexit, of course, poses questions, as does the growth of other international dispute resolution centres. As I'm sure Jonathan would have said, competition is a good thing. That was the ethos Jonathan embodied as chairman of the bar. Legal UK may face challenges, but it's going to compete and compete vigorously. With sound fundamentals, the challenge of competition is one that will be met. More importantly, it can, and no doubt will, in keeping with the CIFOC spirit, be a spur to innovation, cooperation, and improvement. Thank you.